Okay, Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, then I'll bring some context and we'll have some teaching and then we're going to worship and pray. Amen. Amen. And worship and pray. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruits of the trees of the garden, but the fruits of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, Someone say, say the serpent, the serpent. So, so to the woman. You will not surely die, but we shall surely not die. For, the, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and it was pleasant to the eyes, a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave it to her husband, and he ate. And the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves coverings. Verse 8, it says, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves. You want to say it? Hid themselves. Hid themselves. Everyone say, Hid themselves. Hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees. Verse 9. And the Lord God called to Adam and said, Where are you? Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Amen. Can we also go to Jeremiah chapter 2? Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 11. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 11. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 11. If you know, just say amen. amen. Jeremiah 2, verse 11. It says, Has a nation has a nation changed its gods, which are not gods? But my people have changed their glory. For what does not profit? Be astonished, O heavens, um, at this, and be horrified and horribly afraid. Be very desolate, says the Lord. This is the scripture, verse 13. It says, My people, this is God speaking. Okay, God is speaking, he says. My people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and have hewed themselves systems, broken systems, that cannot hold water. Can I ever say two evils? Two evils. Two evils. So Father, we're just going to take this teaching into your hands. Father, we pray that as we speak today, you will give understanding. It will be a clarity. It will empower us, God, to worship you alone. Lord, yes. that anything that would be an idol, anything that will hinder us from, from worshiping you, will be exposed today in Jesus' name. Yes. And Father, we will be free to, to draw near to you, not in our understanding, not in our, in our power, but by your power. Yes. Father, we just surrender right now to your hands. We surrender everything that we're saying. Share, Father, and I pray that it will challenge, it will encourage, it will correct, it will provoke, it will. Put out fires and it will start fires. In the name of Jesus Christ, everybody say Amen. Amen. So we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about prayer and worship today. Prayer and worship. Who's in prayer and worship? Prayer and worship. How many of you like to pray? Ah, good, good. How many of you like to worship God? Oh, good, good. Um, one of the things that's so important about this topic is it connects to the theme of the month. Altars. We're speaking about altars and things like that. We're going to spend a bit of time just to talk to us about our design as human beings. You know, we are designed in a very special way. 
we have divine, de designed in a very, very amazing way. Um, and so every single person has to recognize that um, there is something about this topic of worship that you have to understand. You know? Worship affects many parts of your life. Worship is very important. Just turn to the person next to you and say, Worship is important. They may not smile for you, but look at the person and say, Worship is important. It's so important, really important. Very, very important topic. It's not reserved. Sometimes people see worship to be a charismatic thing. So, you know, um, we've had, you know, can we give a clap for all this as well? When we think of worship, oftentimes we, we think about our culture, we think about our experience. So, you know, we think about worship as an African church, you know. Today, <laughs> you know, the poor white people are afraid to come to our churches because, because you know, some of our songs in Africa and Nigeria, they can't go for a language, but. You know, so many of us, when we have these concepts, these concepts, they're biblical, but sometimes our culture can affect our concepts. Yeah. You know, our, our culture can affect our concepts. So when you think about prayer, you know, depending on your denomination, you can think about prayer. You come from a raw, praying, <laughs> mountain church. You know, when you talk about prayer, listen, there's no looking around. <laughs> And then there's the other kind of churches, you know, if I'm not acting anyone in this place, whoa. <laughs> guys, God is here. <laughs> Let's just connect with God, guys. <laughs> so, so Sovereign. Yes. I want to take time to deal with this. God is sovereign. Can you say it with me? God, God 
is sovereign. He is sovereign. He is God. God actually is his office. That's not his name. God is his office. That is his status. That is his manner. That is his position. That is not his name. Wow. Also understand that he is God for a reason. Now, one of the things we understand about God is that God is the owner of all things. That's one of the reasons why he is sovereign. Yes, sir. Psalm 24 says, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world's. The word earth comes from the word eres, which means the nations. Yes, sir. The word world deals with the word terra firma, which means the man. God is saying the nations and the land all belong to me. Yes. He is dealing with his character. He is sovereign. Someone say sovereign. sovereign. So God is the owner of all things. Not only is God the owner, God is the author. Someone say author. author. That means that God authorized everything. We understand it by what God said about his name in the book of Exodus. Moses was going to deliver a people. And what happens is, is this. He says, he says, listen, if I'm going to go, um, you might to say, send me, I can't just go to the, you don't believe it. Can you let me know who you, you sent me? And he gives this incredible statement. He says, tell them that I am. Send it to you. He doesn't speak in past tense or even future tense. He speaks in an eternal state, an eternal space. Yeah. He describes himself as something that is consistent yeah. beyond time. Yes, yes, sir. He doesn't communicate in future or present tense because he is everything at the same time, all the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He says in Hebrew, yeah, yeah, yeah. I will be whatever I will be. Yeah. He is describing he is the all-sufficient one. Yeah. He is independent of anybody else. He exists independently. Think about that. How many of us have a mobile phone right now? Yeah. Can you imagine your mobile phone always being on and never being charged? Never being to be charged. It needs a show of life. It needs something to charge it because its battery would already go down. God doesn't need batteries. God doesn't need a plug. God exists within himself. He does not need anything externally to function. He says, I am. Yeah. I am. Number three, not only is God the owner, not only is God the author, God is the source of all things. Every single thing finds itself its address. Every single thing finds its address in him. Everything. Every single thing. He is the fountain of living water. He is the source. How many people you know that you cannot live without water? Yeah. You cannot live without water. He describes himself as the fountain of living water. Whenever you see the word S, the like word, especially in the Hebrew culture, it could mean either many or a lot. God created the heavens and the earth, the Shabbai, the heavens. He created everything. He is saying that I am all that you need. Amen? Why am I saying this? This already identifies that every human being right now, whether you believe or don't believe, you find your source in him. This gives the, the reason why we worship God. The word worship, the word know, comes from a word, proskine, it means to bow down. When you go to, uh, like, I'm saying like when you just go to the Queen, you know, you just, just go, when you just go. When you go before a sovereign or an authority, if you're a woman, what do you do? If you're a man, what do you do? But you cannot do that unless you've seen. Did you know what I said? So you cannot respond in that manner until you're positioned correctly. Would you agree? And so when we talk about worship, worship deals with being positioned before an authority. 
Worship deals with you being positioned before an authority and then your response is your position. Amen? The first thing a man has to understand is, is that God is the source of life. He is the source of all things. In his, his office, he is God. If I made everything, I created everything, I sourced everything, so it's humility for me to acquire the technology. And it's humility for you to give me worship. It's good. It's good. Good enough for you, okay? So, worship, in essence, is the result of our knowledge and disposition. Worship is the result of our knowledge and disposition. Every human being is a worshiper. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone. Every, I don't care if you can't rift, you're still a worshiper. Yeah. <laughs> I don't care if you're a believer, you're still a worshiper. Yeah. Now, the reason why that is true is because we see this in these two evils. He says, first and foremost, my people have forsaken me as their source. That tells me that at some point, and you, you read it in the book of Genesis, you see that Adam forsook God. Yeah. Read that yeah. But this is an interesting point. God is the source of our life, the source of our peace, the source of our joy, the source of our wealth. Come on, shout something else. Our peace, what else? Our strength, what else? Our power, our hope, what else? Our comfort, our direction. Our direction, not the horoscope, right? Yeah? For that new age thing that we saw in this place. So we look at yes, I'm talking to you. He is the source of all. Who is the source of all? The source of all. Lord of, Lord of all? Lord of all. Or not at all? Mm. Yeah? That's good. So, He is the source. And so worship begins with recognizing Him as the source. Yes, sir. Now, this is the point I'm going to. Even if a person does not find their life in Him, they will automatically create something to find their life in. Yeah, yes, sir. Yeah. This is identified by the two evils. He said, they have forsaken me, the fountain. Now, they shifted from plan A. Mm. Because every human being finds their life in God. But the second part is that they human themselves, systems or water pots, yeah. broken systems that do not hold any water. Now when we apply that, what we understand is this, is every human being is created to find their worship, their direction, their life, their peace, their strength, their hope in Him. But if they don't, the nature of the way God has made man is that their heart has to occupy that space anyway. Yeah. Has to occupy that place. I know this to be true by reading Psalm 115. Let's look at Psalm 115, verse 3 to 8. Let's look at this. The nature of a human being, you are made spirit, soul, Body, your spirit is God conscious. Your soul is self conscious. Your body is sense conscious. When God made man, God made man in Genesis chapter 1 26, he made him in his image and he made man. In Genesis 2 7, the man said, the Lord God formed man and he breathed. Genesis 1 26, man was made. Genesis 2 7, man was formed. So the man was made in the spirit. Yeah. Yeah. Man's beginning was not on earth. Man's beginning was in heaven. Yeah. Yeah. Man's origin was not on earth. Man's origin was in God. Yeah. And so even though man was formed, when sin came in, man was a container without substance. He lost his source. 
And so now we have to find this source for something else. Let's read it. The first Psalms 115, verse 3. But our God is in. He does, I love this, he does what? That's what he loves. Say that right now. Michael. He does what he pleases. Next one. Then he goes immediately. Their idols are like silver and gold. The world of the man's hands continue. They are mouths, but they do not speak. Eyes are like, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. No one they have, but they do not smell. They have hands, but they do not handle. Feet they have, but they do not walk. Nor do they matter through their throats. Continue. Look at this scripture. Look at this scripture. Worship is a very powerful thing. Because whatever you worship, you wear it. Whatever you worship in your heart, you will wear it in your body. Are you with me? It says, those who make them are like them. Those who make them are like them. So is everyone who trusts in them. That means that you can know how what sort of worships by looking at their physical life. Your physical life is the fruit of the God that you're worshiping right now. I realize that people can be in a room and people can be shouting Jesus, but it does not necessarily mean it's the same God in the Bible. I don't expect it to be like that. Because I'm coming from your gods. I'm coming from your gods. It may be you. It's one thing to call his name Jesus, but it's another thing to experience the Christ. This principle in the scripture teaches us that when we ascribe worship to something from our hearts, our bodies will always fall. I know it's true because you can see it when people go to football. That football club is like a church, I'm telling you. And the team manager is like a pastor. <laughs> I'm telling you. So although I'm not against football, what I'm saying is that every single person conforms into the image of the God they worship in their hearts. Yeah. And God can be anything. Turn to your neighbor and say, God can be anything. God. It can be anything. I mean, no one in this place would call themselves an animal maker in this place, would they? No one would actually say, I don't know about you, maybe you are in here and you can understand, I don't deal with you in prayer later on. But, no one really, the majority in the Western culture, no one really thinks about witchcraft because the way the culture is designed in secularism and postmodernism, we have a lot of ologies, we have psychologies, and this ology, but, but it's very hard for the Western world to have an understanding about witchcraft and idolatry yeah. and spiritualism because many of those things are hidden yeah. in ologies. Yeah. And so people yeah. don't understand that actually some of these ologies and isms and schisms are actually shrines that people are worshipping. Sectarianism, syncretism, this ology and that ology, all these ologies, all these mentalities, philosophies are actually gods. And then there's the obvious one. There's some other ones that are, are less obvious because no one in this place, or most people in this country, would not have a shrine in their house where they kneel down and offer idols and offer worship. Yeah. Most, people don't. most people wouldn't have a cauldron. If you need me, I still love you, we'll deal with it later. But what happens is, is this mask, and the devil knows this. He knows the nature of man. He knows that man was born to be a worshipper. Let me tell you something about worship a little bit further. Worship starts by first and foremost observation. Can you understand if you're thinking not? Worship starts by observation. Let me not say to you that this is the looks at the, the pulpit and worshiping you. No. But what your heart gives over to observe. In the book of Genesis, Adam was there was no pulpit, there was no physical altar. All Adam was doing was watching God. All he was doing was 
in a position watching God, like a child does a father. Worship was not 2D. Many of us only know about worship and praise in 2D. What is 2D? What I mean is this. Is, it is just words. You just talk, talk back. But worship from the Bible, when you look at Adam's relationship, worship was three-dimensional. Yes, God came. Worship was encounter. Worship was all encompassing of all of the three realms, the spirit, the soul, and the body. Worship involved the spirit, the soul, and the body. When sin came in, sin dismantled all of this. And unfortunately, even Christians now just view worship as understanding. Are you all here? Yes. So I'm not saying, so when it comes to worship, really and truly, many people wouldn't have an idol. No, we wouldn't have an idol in the house. We wouldn't have a shrine or talisman and that kind of stuff. The majority don't have that. But the question is, is what system, what pot do you go to draw life from? What's your pot? What's your part? I felt like a Jamaican. I wish I had a job. Can I borrow this for a second? It's not, no, it's not big. So we read from the scripture that those who make them are like them. So God is the original fountain. He's the original source of life. You must, just like the phone and the charger, you need to connect to him, you plug in. Yeah. Plug into him. You know, Christianity, people say Christianity is boring. Some people say it's boring. I remember watching one of quotes, and like a meme by one well-known minister, and he had a picture of a TV without a plug. Christianity, boring Christianity is the same as a TV without a plug. Until you plug in, you're not going to have no joy. Until you plug in, yours is not working because it's not plugged in. Does that make sense? Yes. God is the source of life, right? But when a person does not trust in Him or posture themselves, they will indirectly or directly create a plan B. It is ah. human nature. So we say plan B. I want to go to this place. Oh, you don't get me. When I first come to Christ, I believed in Jesus Christ. Amen. Trust me. Amen. Amen. All that kind of stuff. But there were some idols in my life. There were some plan Bs. There were some things that just in case I don't find life in Him, let me go and drink from pornography. Let me go and drink from this person. Yeah. And so, the issue of those idols is that the Bible describes them as broken systems. They cannot hold water. What does it mean practically for you? You could try and get comfort with it with waiting. Can you imagine drinking from a cup that's leaking? That's why you, 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 you thought you had three or four boyfriends and one of you had a piece, you have a piece. It's because they were never designed to fulfill that function in your life. You thought you left that job, you got another job, you can't find peace. But the thing about it is that you said, yes, you get paid more, find all of that, and now you can buy Netflix and all that kind of stuff. You can buy, you want your budget, it's good, but you don't feel satisfied. Yeah. Because it was not designed yes. to hold what you're looking for. Yeah. And unfortunately, this is an issue. I don't condemn people who are dealing with issues anymore. I don't condemn them. Why? Because even if the person is looking for a, a prostitute or drinking or raping, to be honest with you, all they're looking for is Jesus. Yeah. But they don't know the avenue by which they find him. Wow. They don't know the avenue. They, try, they, they know they need to worship. They don't need to find their life in something, but they keep trying to find it. I try to put my peace in this guy, but they keep breaking him up. I try to put my peace in this, and they get frustrated, but all they're looking for is Jesus. They are deprived. And so, the issue of it is, is that the, the, the deception that the enemy uses is a principle. You take on the characteristics of anything that you worship. Anything you worship, you take on the character and attributes of that thing. Can you imagine? It's a powerful thing. 
When this goes to John chapter 12, verse 10, I want you to look at something very, very powerful. <coughs> this is very, for me, it's powerful. So the first principle is the sovereignty of God. He is sovereign by some of these The second thing is, is the depravity of man. Without God, man is still going to be a worshiper. But without God, he will worship the wrong God. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil on spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. Now, I want to understand this. Because this woman, and this is the thing about the Old Testament, it starts off with God being sovereign. God sovereign there, the Lord. And then we have a, a man like Adam. Adam, what did he do? He sinned against God, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah? What did he do? He sowed. He sowed what? Someone said fig leaves. He sowed fig leaves, right? I'll say this first. He sowed what? Fig leaves. That is the first, that is the introduction of religion. That is the introduction of religion. Man's nakedness, rather than being clothed with God, he tried to cover himself. That is the introduction of religion. The fig leaf, the thing about it is that in the Old Testament, I can understand why he did that type of way when he walked around and he saw a fig leaf that had no fruit. He was like, I remember you. You're, you're, you, you, you're that thing that my sons tried to, you'll be cursed. Sowing fig leaves together is a symbol of religion or symbol of man's attempt to cover his, his, his depravity. It's man's attempt to find something on earth to cover a spiritual problem. That's what the thing is to be found. And I'm saying this because God wants to pick up with me today. Amen. We'll get there in a minute. Now the point I'm saying the thing is that worship is very powerful because like I said, think about this scenario. This woman, she recognized her depravity. She came. Now in culture, the guests would be the further in the house. So she, uh, this woman, she took this costly oil, and you read it later on, what happens is you see that people are annoying. Annoying. Why did she do all this kind of stuff? What did you picture in your mind? This woman, for her to even get to Jesus, she would have to do something serious. Okay? Oh, so you just stand, stand there for a moment. Actually, you just stand by here. Okay? A man Otis is Jesus, right? In the culture, what would happen is that the guests would be the furthest inside the house. Right? So that's Jesus, and he's the guest of Jesus' house. This woman, let me read it like this, and just read it and go over it. This woman, there would have been many different leaders all around. Are you following what I'm saying? So in order for her to even get on to Jesus, she would have to, to have gone through all of these people. Do you know what that means she had to break protocol? Because she recognized her depravity. She recognized that there's something that I need from him. What happened is that she broke through all the protocols and all the issues and all the politics of the Christian day and all that kind of stuff. And the Bible says she poured out her oil on him and then the whole house was full of oil. The reason that's so powerful is this. Can you imagine the controversy? The controversy of a woman leaving with the same perfume as Jesus. Leaving her house. She leaves in the evening time. Can you imagine the scandal? And then you see Jesus coming out of the house as well, smelling of the same thing. Can you imagine the scandal? But I'm saying this because when people recognize that they can't find their life in anything else and they come to Jesus, no matter how deprived they are, what God will do is clothe you with the same aroma as He has. Can you imagine? So whatever he smells of, he's not the smell of his wife. I'm saying this because whatever your issue is, as long as the woman can just get to Jesus, if she was smelling like outside, it doesn't make a difference because when she worships, when she postures herself before him, she takes on this. I want to smell like Jesus. I don't know about you. I want to smell. You don't have to smell like issues of life. When you posture yourself, you can smell like him. Yeah. The principle is this. Whatever you worship, you wear the own right. I'm going somewhere. 
most powerful about this is, is in the Old Testament, God starts off by displaying his sovereignty, so his power. And as I said, man started off with him, and then what happens? He sins against God, and he sins against God in a very significant way. What was the introduction? What was the beginning? What was the start of sin? The start of sin, we can see in the scripture, is this word covetousness. So we say covetousness. So we say comparison. Adam was righteous with God. He was in right standing with God. He was right with Him. But the way deception, the way sin entered in, was by challenging God's character and, make, and creating a, a false need in Adam. There's one thing to have everything together. It's another thing to be deceived to think that you don't have what you actually need. You know, one of the biggest this, this parts of deception is this. The snake tried to deceive, but the snake deceived Adam to think that he could be like him without him. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. To be like God without God's means. And I say that the end of the thing and the process must be pure. Yeah. Yes, sir. The process must be as pure at the end. Are you still here? So the Old Testament, we learn like that man's need is deprived, he's unable, and all these different kind of things. And then God, in his infinite wisdom, he starts off by dealing with man's depravity. You know, God doesn't mind you having a need. Is that okay? Yeah. It's okay. The first point is, let's be honest, what we need. But one of the things so powerful in the Bible is this is that God uses the needs of man to reveal his, his sovereign nature. Yeah. Yeah. 4,000 years of man's depravity, and then God sends Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ comes through man's depravity. John chapter 4, give me a drink. The woman, by the way, she had a need. Who he has a need? You know what I realize is after counseling people and having various discussions with people, sometimes the actual problem is not the problem. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. Sometimes the issue that we may battle and fight yeah. is not the actual issue. Yeah. Sometimes it's just the symptom yeah. of the actual issue. Is that what I'm saying? Sometimes it may not be a matter of, you know, uh, how many symptoms are there? You know, I mean, a lot of Christians, I just don't like people. Just people. I, mean, I love God. You know, people. Just, just people. Just, just give me God. God, you can have your followers. Just people. And then with people, it may be an area of trust. Right. Right. I see angry. I'm just always angry. You know, it's not like, the might be that you're hurt. Yeah, yeah. The point I'm trying to wrestle with is this, is that when a man, as in not male, a man has a need, they'll always aim to get it met somehow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They'll always aim to get it met somehow. Yeah. This is a matter of trust. Let me just read this down here for John chapter 4, verse John chapter 4, verse 6 to 10. If I move from verse 6 to 10. 6 to 8, are you guys there? Yes. Are you guys there? Yes. John chapter 4, verse 6 says, Now, Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being weary from his journey, sat by the well, and it was the sixth hour, and the woman of Samaria came to draw water. Came to draw water. Jesus said, Give me a drink. You know what's so powerful about this? The woman's in need. The woman's in need. But he 
is trying to challenge her motivation for coming. The woman is in need of water. But he's saying to her, listen, why don't you give me something to drink? So stay with me. Verse 8, it says, the disciples have gone away into the city to buy food. Verse 9, the woman of Samaria said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask me, um, ask from me, a Samaritan woman, for the Jews have no need of Samaritan. Verse 10, Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God, and who it is who trusts, who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Remember that living water? He would have given you living water. He, Jesus was trying to challenge the woman's lifestyle. Yeah. Is it all about this drink? Is it all about what you need? Wow. He was challenging her depravity. Let's put it in the natural, natural. Is it all about paying bills and dying? Is all, all, why don't you come work for me? Are you hearing what I'm saying? He was challenging the woman's earthly need to open up her mind to realize that there is a heavenly reality and source that you can draw from. Let's continue reading. Let's talk to thank you. Thank you. Are you? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as well as his son and his livestock? Verse 13. Jesus says, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. He's identifying that, listen, even if you get that physical need met, you're still going to not be satisfied. The gospel of Jesus Christ, you never see him preach in the same way to the same people. But the only thing about Jesus Christ is that in his compassion, he recognizes the need of all of the people, but he uses it as a doorway to invite them into his sovereignty, yeah. into him being the source. You know what I'm saying to you today? Yes, I don't need a job, but don't you know I'm the master employer? Hmm. <laughs> He's saying to you that today, even though, yes, that girl they come from, don't you know that I am a comforter? Mm. Mm, you're quiet. <laughs> yes, I know you need that house. I know you know that in my father's house. God, his sovereignty, he uses our depravity to highlight his sovereignty. Sometimes, Parents have to let children suffer a little bit. Do you know that? Yeah. I'm a social worker, so no one's been looking at me like I'm um, <coughs> crazy. Like, I also you know, do also know about social policy. No one's saying that. Uh, no one's saying that your children should suffer. You know, you tweet it on Instagram. Can you just calm down? <laughs> As parents, God is a good father. And sometimes, what can I allow? And God is infinite wisdom. He can sometimes allow healthy suffering for man to recognize what we need. I know it is. But sometimes, certain things don't work out so that you can draw life from Him. You wouldn't have faith like you had if you didn't get what you got. Yeah. Some things have to shut down. You look at me like what I'm talking about. They have to tell you no for you to pray. Yeah. I'm trying to come against this genie Jesus that many people are yeah. worshiping. Yeah. The God, and I'm going somewhere. The God who we can worship or control. Mm. The God who we can worship and manipulate. The Bible says that even though they knew him as God, they did not worship him as God and they changed the glory. Yeah. You cannot worship without being a kingdom person. <coughs> worship is not for religious people. Yeah. Against popular culture, worship is not for the religious. Worship is for kings, it's for citizens of a country. What other matter than that? Because most of people, even in this generation, have grown up with different concepts of 
for rulership. There are many different kinds of rulership. There is uh, policy or you know, um, politics. What's the word? Um, oh, democracy. Democracy is the rule of an opinion. Yeah. Then you have a leadership, like in the Asian culture, you have the rule of a family or a dynasty. Okay? But we are a theocracy. That is the rule of a king. Now, when you apply political thinking to a king, you end up reasoning with what you're worshiping. And you cannot worship a God that you keep reasoning with. Mm, I don't know what you're saying. Yeah, I don't know what you're saying. <coughs> worship is actually a posture of submission. You don't consult your emotions first, you consult, you consult scripture first. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Some of us are so used to consulting our day before you consult the ancient of days. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny that I don't feel no. mm. <laughs> and other same people, unfortunately, that's why they're still bad. Because worship does not change God, it changes you. Yes. Amen. Worship is the culmination of the spirit, soul, and body being in Christ. Worship is a smell that goes up before God. Yes, sir. What does that mean? It means that as we're living right now, as we're living and acting right now, an altar of our heart is given off an aroma. Yes. This is the law of the burnt offering, the law of the peace offering in Leviticus. The worship, the sacrifice on the altar will go up to God and God will smell it because the nose is symbolic. It relates to discernment, it relates to memory. When the people are, don't be funny when I say this. In wine tasters, right? Wine tasters, they smell wine, it brings back memory. So when we worship God in Christ, He, he smells and He should remember the sacrifice on the cross. When we come to God and present our bodies and our souls from our heart, when He, he smells and listen, it's not just a singing song, it's our conversation, that's worship. It's how we spend our time, that's worship. It is how we talk about each other. That's worship. Yeah, yeah. It is how we spend our money. That's worship. <laughs> you can be quick to buy them 10 shoes and discounts. And how much for your money? Worship is the culmination of the, the fruits of the soul's activity, the body's activity, and the spirit's activity. That's worship. Yeah. Is that what I'm saying? Yes. Yeah. Challenges. Jesus Christ challenges. He comes through the needs of people. He doesn't, he doesn't disregard them. He doesn't say, listen, you shouldn't desire that. He says, listen, I am gonna, I'm going to come through the alley to show you that I'm more than that issue. So how about you come to me beyond that issue? Come to me for me, yeah. and you'll get the issue free. I like the rap, is that a good I'm saying this because the strategy of the enemy is to use man's depravity and his need to blind him from heaven. When that happens, worship becomes reserved to whether you have your needs fulfilled or not. Worship was first mentioned in Genesis 22 when Abraham sacrificed his son. Can you imagine that worship first mentioned deals with exchange of desire? When Abraham gave his son, he was giving his desires to God. Worship is to give your desire to him. <coughs> Can
I know what I'm worshiping because I am my desires in the hand of God. Desire, health, business, finance, friendship, whatever. Boyfriend, husband, whatever it is, that is in the hand of God. What is the sign that something is in the hand of God? Peace. Peace is a confirmation of promise. Amen. Philippians chapter 4, verse 67 says, Be anxious for nothing by everything. Make your requests known to God. And then the peace. A sign of true worship is peace. Peace is not just a condition of euphoria, and peace is a person in Jesus Christ. Yes. Yes. So Jesus Christ comes through the diversity of the woman and he introduces her to his sovereignty. In Genesis, in Exodus chapter 32, like I said before, Exodus 32, those who know the story, what happened is, is Moses was on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. You know the story. Yeah. Those who don't know the reference of Genesis 32, he's on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. And the Bible said that Aaron, or sorry, the people who had left Egypt, said, Listen, as for this Moses, we don't know where he is. Please, Aaron, can you make us a God? Can you imagine? The, and if you understand the significance of the story, it reflects Jesus Christ being in heaven. So notice the type of Jesus Christ in heaven, 40 days before that symbol of a dispensation period. Yeah, yeah. And he's in heaven, or he's on the mountain. The mountain in the Bible is symbolic of the heavenly realm. So he's on the mountain. Are you with me still? Yes, sir. And the people get anxious. Now, how do I know what tests my worship? Time. Yeah. Time will tell whether your worship is pure. Jesus on the mountain in this picture. Moses on the mountain, symbolic of Jesus Christ. He had ascended to heaven. And the people were like, yes, it's going to be back anytime soon now. They're, they're, they're waiting for the mountain, waiting, waiting, trusting. We can't wait, we can't wait for our deliverer to come back. 30 days, 35 days, 36, 37, 40 days. Now, where's Moses? <laughs> Where's he at? Can you guys see Moses? <laughs> you see, can you see Moses? <laughs> so interesting that our idols or our plan B is revealed at the place where we feel like the It's easy to praise. Even an evil man can be generous in times of good. <laughs> Even an evil man can be generous in times of good. Hitler was a very good leader. His leadership skills are powerful. Even though his character and things is wicked, he's a good leader. Time we need to challenge. Not time we need to even cause the system to be exposed. They start to say, listen, Moses, can you make us a God? Let me translate it. The carnality of the people, the impatience of the people, put pressure on the leaders of their time to change the character of God to meet their idols. This is what we have in this generation, where people, unfortunately, rather than humbling and dying, yes, I said it, dying, and allowing time to challenge, what they then do is they say to the leaders of the church, give us a God that we can worship and control. Give me a Jesus that can still call him Jesus, but I can control him, fit him in my pocket, and I can ask him whatever I need. Mean. The Bible says they made God and they danced around him, all Jesus, all these kind of things. We have to destroy our idols. We have to destroy our desired yeah. Jesuses. We have to destroy our I Jesus that we made in our hearts. Our African Jesus. Mm. <laughs> our English Jesus. Our Jesus that we can worship in this way. But we place a demand on his character. A Jesus that we can say, it's okay, worship me, but continue to 
to, to, to fornicate. Now, Jesus doesn't even worship. It's okay. Jesus got me not. Jesus got golden power. Jesus, he doesn't mind if you're a gossip. A fake person. Someone who, who can love to faces but cut people behind their back. That, that you know, it's okay. You can continue to worship that kind of, of Jesus. But there's no life in that Jesus. So when Moses came down the mountain, he came down and he heard a sound. And he couldn't make out the sound because the people changed the image and they created an idol, they erected an altar, same name, different attributes. Then he came down and he said, guys, what? Aaron, what are you doing? I believe there is an accountability on the pulpit to preach the truth. Yeah. Yeah. I believe there's an accountability yeah. for the leaders. Yeah. Listen, you may not like what I have to say, I actually don't mind. Mm. You know? Because I'm going to be accountable for yeah. God for not preaching to people's idols or prophesying to people's idols. You know? And Aaron succumbed to the pressure, the pressure of two billion people, two million people saying, change our God. Change our God. Give us a new age God. Give us a God that we can manhandle, mishandle, a God that doesn't challenge our integrity, a God that doesn't challenge us to pray, a God that doesn't challenge us. Give us that kind of God. And Moses came and said, is that the God I need you? Then, he said, listen, <laughs> if you're on the Lord's side, you guys have to come over here. Yeah. Yeah. That idol, that plan B that you have made, you need to destroy that. Mm. And the Bible says that brothers and sisters have to separate themselves. Wow. I know you're like what I'm saying today. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying all this short time. You know, one of the things that can actually hold people together is a lie, not the truth. The truth will separate, it makes things clear. Sometimes we are held in a bad life with not bold enough to tell people the truth. What happened is, is that the people took out their sword. <laughs> what, a, what a nice thing it is. They took out their sword and they cut and they sanctified. They, they cut people, they killed people. Symbolic of you may need to kill some relationships for you to walk in and worship. Yeah. 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 You might need to cut off. I know we're going to pray in a minute, but we might need to practicalize this. If I'm going to be a true worshiper of God, if I want my heart to have God on, on the altar of my heart, I may need to adjust my lifestyle. Mm -hmm. I need the help of the Holy Spirit to do that, and I may need to do that. I was the Levites. This is the Levites. Where a Levite needed to hear or to be attached to. The Levites, the ones who hear, those who have the Spirit here, here to hear, let them hear what the Spirit is saying. They came over, the ones who were here, they came over, crossed over to Moses, crossed over, and they went in, they ground their plan B to the ground. Hmm. Have you ever put something on the altar with God? Went back, you know, even the souls of this. God, yeah. Lord, I give you my heart. You my and then, gets to Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> Lord, I can if I lose that job, I'm going to follow you. Mm. <laughs> it's it's pretty thing. But God couldn't understand. You know, because of that false doctrine, God couldn't understand. God doesn't understand. But God in his infinite love does not change his actions. <coughs> yeah, that's good. For our sake. Yeah, that's good. For our sake. And so what does it mean practically for you and me? I want to be like the Levites. I want to be like the people who in anticipation of his coming are willing to tell it and rely on that plan name. Mm -hmm. Who knows the scripture? Trust in the Lord with all. all. All your heart. All. Everyone say all. Oh. And this is my point. Jesus Christ redeemed us, brought us back through the depravity to bring us to where he is. But we have a responsibility. You know these three things are we need to do. 
the first thing we must do is acknowledge our need. It is only to know that you need something. The first need that God wants everyone to recognize is that they need salvation. They need life. And that life is found in Him. As a part of that need, there are various things that God knows you need. He knows that you need care, direction, peace, all these things. Thank God for the grace of God. So what's the grace? grace? The divine ability of God that came through Jesus Christ. The cross was an altar, the cross was a doorway. Yes, yes, yes. The cross was an altar, the cross was a doorway. Grace came through the cross. And the grace gives you at least three abilities. One, it gives you strength. Two, it, it sanctifies you. And three, it delivers you. Everything that you need will come through grace. Christ's humility to know what he needs. Is that correct? The only thing I love about it is God wants you to ask him. This is prayer. He wants to ask him. But the second point is you need to have the right answer. It's okay to have the job as your prayer point. But what's the first about God? There are three things that God cannot do. One, God cannot lie. That's right. Two, God cannot deny himself. And three, God cannot be seconded. He can't. By the reason of his office, he cannot be second. And so, when it comes to seeking first the kingdom, your needs come into play, but he has to be first. I also want to get something what I'm saying today. Humility is to acknowledge the need. But three, there has to be order. There has to be order. Know your need. Number two, be humble. Humble yourself and ask you. Number three, you need to know order. Now, why am I saying this? Because we worship God based upon order, not emotion. Our uh, people worship God, our lifestyle, based upon order. Order means He is the head, He is the fountain, He is the, the source of my life. I find my life in Him. Why is that important? If you don't worship God, you don't understand the protocols in worship and in prayer. What happens is, is we end up diluting our worship because we worship the job of the God. You worship your wife more than God. Your family more than God. You worship ministry more than God. You worship your position more than God. You worship your purpose more than God. So only all God wants us to do today is He wants us to remove our plan B, trust in Him, and be willing to challenge any idol. Are you prepared to do that for yourself? I can't do it for you. I need to challenge any idol in my life. If you're expecting the born again, idolatry starts off by being self-sufficient. What does that mean? The first kind of God is you. When Adam turned from God as his reference for life and direction, he became a God. He began to consult his reasoning and his logic. Right and wrong came, right and wrong came from him, yeah. rather than from God. The tree of life, humanism. Right and wrong is based upon what I think, rather than what God says. Yeah. Gospel of Jesus Christ is not about just making bad people good. The gospel of Jesus Christ is about making dead people alive. Worship is not just be singing songs. Worship is be fighting your life in Him. I believe it's so important for everyone and anyone to take time to read, study about worship. We can really go into this, but we're not going to go into it today. Let's just stand up. Finding life in Him. I can just invite you guys back here. 
Yeah. 